Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Resilient Riches. Today, we're going to learn all about the political sector, and we have a congresswoman here with us today, the only Jewish congressman woman in all of Georgia, a fighter and defender of freedom right now, and uh, one of the biggest clarity voices that I've heard on the Democratic side that's been speaking about anti-Semitism, fighting against this, this new hate, but also giving a real le- line of clarity before her. November. So Esther Panich, we're really excited for this conversation. I'm honored that you came on. I know that you were, you're a, uh, a recovering lawyer and, and you decided to go into the harder drug, which is politics. So we're really excited for you. For you. Uh, you. Can you give everybody a two minute background? And then we have a lot of political questions because we're getting a lot of questions about also who we're endorsing and all these different things. And I said, why don't we just get somebody amazing on? And I thought nobody better but you. Well, thank you. Uh, And I appreciate you having me here today. So I, my name is Esther Panich. I'm a legislator in Georgia. We call them representatives in within the state. Uh, Generally for us, Congress people are the people who go to DC. So I'm a state representative. I represent areas of Atlanta in the Northeast suburbs, Sandy Springs, Roswell, and a little bit of Johns Creek. For anybody who follows election laws and trials, that I'm in Fulton County, which is where certain prosecutions have taken place or are taking place and related to elections. And uh, that's my constituency. It is a larger area for Jewish representation, although it's not very large compared to the general population, but there are about 150,000 Jews in Georgia and about 50,000 of them live around me, but not all in my district. So it's, but so by the default, because I'm the only Jewish representative, I tend to get called about all issues related to Jews and how politics or, or legislation affects us. So Atlanta is in your area, just to clarify. Yes. I'm, I'm not in the city of Atlanta. I'm a suburb. So it's the Metro area of Atlanta. Gotcha. So let, let's just ask a few things, because I know one thing that you've been pioneering and you've been probably the, one of the biggest leaders in the country is this whole uh, the Rose Bill, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism and helping to, to give some security to students. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. In Georgia, it was known as HB 30, which is the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And it came up actually before I was ever in office. Uh, Representative John Carson, somebody not Jewish, found himself feeling from his heart that his job, among others, is to protect the Jewish community. And so when he saw that anti-Semitism was rising even before October 7th, he took it upon himself to draft a bill to adopt the IRA definition which is the gold standard definition around the world. And so it addresses both the, the um, conventional anti-Semitism that we all see from like Nazi swastikas and KKK and the more conventional, uh, I'm sorry, contemporary anti-Semitism, which was what we are seeing from the left, which is when Zionism is used as code for Jew. And so this, definition with his examples addresses both things. And this came over from Europe in 2016. They started seeing all of this, especially on the left, years ago, and we're already addressing it. And so the U.S. is now just catching up, essentially. But John brought forward this this bill along with uh, the Jewish representative at the time, Mike Walensky, and it, it made it out of the House, not the Senate. And so because that was the end of a two year cycle, it had to be brought up again. And that's when I came into office. So John and I co-signed the bill and brought it forward. And at the same time, within a week or two, it was already getting, uh, it was already getting hearings, but just not a lot of attention. And then the Goyam Defense League decided to put flyers around Atlanta on Jewish homes including mine. So that got international attention because I'm the only Jewish What is that organization you mentioned? It's called the Goyim Defense League. That's what they call themselves. It's a far right, you know, Jew hating, um, Nazi sympathizing, 
group and they will, they're the ones who will put like holograms onto, onto um, buildings to say, you know, all sorts of negative things. They'll put banners on, on um, interstates. Uh, and so they do flyers in the middle of the night, they'll go out and fly our communities, which has a large, have a large percentage of Jewish population. So you wake up, you see these awful flyers, which talk about Satan and Jews and, you know, just terrible things. And kids see these things and they're in little plastic envelopes. Sometimes there's corn in them, which nobody really understood why, but I think it's just to weigh them down. And then, um, and so that's what happened. So I called the police to report it uh, and, hundreds of other families had gotten into. And we had known that this was going on throughout Georgia. It had happened multiple times in other parts of the state. So, but when I called the police to report it, and because I'm a, a political official, I'm an elected official, it got a lot of attention. So, so I spoke from the floor of the house the next day, talking about what it means to be a Jewish woman in Atlanta in this time. And this was again in 2023, the beginning of 2023. So I was a new representative. And so this bill got a lot of attention because of it. People thought I introduced this bill in response to the flyers. It was already in, it was already being heard. And, but it just got a lot more attention at that point because the bill wouldn't necessarily stop people from, from dropping flyers which around here is protected speech. But if that person committed a crime, defaced my property, harmed me personally, then evidence of his anti-Semitic intent could be used to prosecute him for a hate crime. It's very interesting. And by the way, the head of this Goyim Defense League in Georgia has already been convicted of a hate crime. Well, it wasn't a hate crime at the time of harming, assaulting an African-American man and served prison time years ago. So this isn't some big reach that this person may con end up being violent. And so this is kind of the genesis of what happened. But then it kind Did of- Did they take the name from us? Is that, is that where the Goyim name came from? I'm sorry? The Goy they, they called themselves the Goyim. Yeah. Did they take it from us on purpose? I assume so. I have no idea. I, I can't get into their heads. But it's that is Martin, the name Martin, of the place. Uh, of the group. That's a crazy thing, though. It is, it is wild. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, so obviously it was going, it was, uh, you, did you get it passed at that point or did yeah. you have to wait till October 7th or not wait so, till October 7th, <clears throat> October 7th happened and you were able to do something more? So that session, it made it out of the house again, although there was significant dissension by my colleagues, my democratic colleagues, and I'm a Democrat, um, more from the far left of my party, which was really devastating to me because they thought they had the right to define anti-Semitism, that they were speaking over me. So it made it out of the House. The Senate did nothing with it. The session ended. And by the way, on the night of the vote in the House was Arif Purim. I couldn't have scheduled this. I, I had no control over the calendar. It was Arif Purim and I'm Esther. So of course we talked about that in my speech, which was really cool. And then um, it, the Senate didn't call it. We waited to the last, to the clock was ticking for the last moments of the Senate. We thought it would get called up and it did not. So then we had to start with the next session. And, but during the, our sessions go January to generally the end of March. Uh, but this time we had a strategy. We knew that there was a division among my colleagues because JVP um, had come in and essentially told the non-Jewish legislators that they represented the Jewish community and they were opposed to the bill. So we learned of that and we had to do a lot of educating. JVP, can you just uh, just- they, Yeah, they call themselves Jewish Voices for Peace or an okay. anti-Zionist far left terror supporting group. Uh, there's nothing Jewish about them. They, they're terrible and they're terrible and they're dangerous to the mainstream Jewish community. Correct. So they, but they had managed to convince non-Jewish legislators that this was kind of like an internal debate among the Jewish community and that we were evenly split on this definition, which was not, 
nothing could have been further from the truth. We had letters from about 90% of the Jewish community representatives in terms of organizations and synagogues and groups, all supporting this definition. So it took John and me months to essentially go around and teach my, our colleagues that it was the Jewish community supported this bill overwhelmingly. Were they so, open to your discussion when you went around those couple of months? Was that an open or yes. was that like pulling teeth and you saying these people don't represent us and you this is not the way to go? Some it was harder for some people than others. Some people already just had a bias against the bill, so nothing was going to change their mind. Others were more open to listening and didn't know. You know, they just figured it was a kind of an internal community debate that they didn't want to weigh in on. But once they realized that JVP is fringe, and we also brought out the Jewish community to the Capitol multiple times in order for people to meet with their legislators and to see that this was important to the Jewish community. And we did town halls. This was all pre-October 7th. And then October 7th happened. And the main issue that we had had a problem with was people believing that anti-Zionism could also be anti-Semitism. After October 7th, that became obvious to everybody. So because if it was just about Israel's government or policies, anti-Semitism wouldn't have skyrocketed after October 7th. And it did. So people could see it for themselves at that point and what we had been saying made a lot more sense to them and they could you know they didn't have to take our word for it they could see it themselves yeah so it's, it's so interesting that the jewish for voice jewish voices for peace right now is actually a very popular movement but what i what i'm blown away is not po i wouldn't say popular they're just more well known because they're in the marches they're they're constantly being quoted but now what what's blowing me away is that they actually mattered and they actually do real harm to the jewish community even pre-october 7th and that these yes. are these are fringe groups that are not helping and they're really actually causing serious problems correct they cause serious problems they cause this bill to not be passed for at least a year year maybe two and so i don't know what happened before i got there in terms of their interactions but i know that they lied because they would say that they represented the Jewish community and they didn't. So we once we caught on to what they were doing, we managed to work around them and um, and then they didn't part play a part at all once once it went to the Senate. So they you know, we were able to marginalize them very well once okay. we figured out what they were doing. And in fact, there was a <clears throat> there was a we had a special session after October 7th and before our normal January session to deal with um, redrawing election, you know, uh, districts had nothing to do with October 7th. And we, my a colleague and I, Brent Cox, introduced a condemn Hamas resolution. And because it was soon after October 7th, the first time we could. And one of my colleagues brought in members of JVP to the gallery to essentially say, look, there are Jews who oppose this resolution and here they are. So I spoke after my colleague and I looked up at the gallery and I said, and, you know, to and I, it gave me a chance to explain to everybody who was seated, all my all my colleagues at once, who they were. And I said, listen, there were Jews who also supported the Nazis until it was too late. These are the JVP types. They are, for, for Christians in this group, they are the Westboro Baptist Church. They are not a representation of, of us, just like Westboro is not a representation of you. And I turned up and I said, I turned to them and I said, in JVP, Hamas would kill you too. And that was the end of my speech. Great it was job. a lot of fun. That's where I'm like feeling I should give you a standing ovation. Because no, I, no, no, no. I but that speech with you. Could I just go back for one second? The, the sure. fact I grew up in Canada, so it's a different system for me. The fact that it doesn't get into the Senate, it's not called for the Senate. Is that something intentional from yes. the senators that they don't want to have that? Is that or is it just bureaucratic and whatever? No. Well, I didn't know at the time because we had a brand new lieutenant governor who is the president of the Senate. 
I didn't know if he was overwhelmed or he chose not to do it. Later, I found out, this is after my first session, that it failed, that it wasn't called up in the Senate, that there was a senator who was essentially saying he had an entire group of senators who would vote no on it. And nobody wants to bring up a bill they know is going to fail. So it's, it wasn't called. We had to deal with that senator afterwards also, and he was very difficult to deal with. But we managed to get him to stand down and or his leadership managed to get him to stand down because they believed this bill was necessary. And there was a lot of pressure on the governor. It's a Republican controlled uh, legislature and we have a Republican governor and they had some pressure to do something to help the Jewish community as well. So it was a group effort um, and I'm grateful to them for doing this. I mean, I, I, you know, we may be opposite on a lot of issues, but I, I'll never um, deny what they've done to help the Jewish community. And I'm yeah, forever grateful for it. Was that only able to be done after October 7th or this is yes. in the works beforehand or only because of October 7th was the leadership able to get him to stand down? I, I, he was still standing up after October 7th. So I, I don't know, but I think the pressure and they said they believed it was the right thing to do. So they kind of did whatever they needed to do to get him to stand down. And um, cause I'm not in that party and, and he stood down. And I mean, there, there were still objections uh, including a Senator who represents a large part of the Jewish community who spoke against the bill, made some awful statements and then chose to walk out on the actual vote. So, and that's, you mentioned the Lubins, David ran against the Senator. Yeah, she's um, not a great person at all. She's not but my favorite. I, I don't like her vote. I don't like her personally because she doesn't- Fair enough, she but- She doesn't but, represent my values. There you uh, go. Which is not me not wanting to die. It's just a new value of mine. Just really, I'd like to my government <laughs> to protect me. It's a new concept. Um, oh yes, new, and it was, and she got significant pushback for it. Good, good, and uh, and it's it's amazing what you've what you've gone through, and I think it's a big problem for a lot of the youth and a lot of a lot of America is that they just expect their vote to equal the representation of their values. But you might vote for somebody because of one issue, but they might not be aligned with you across the board. How do you deal with that? Like, how do people get actual information to know where and what their actual representatives are doing for them? The only way to know that is to talk to your representative and everybody has access to speak to their representative. If they do not, if they cannot reach the representative after trying a reasonable amount of times, then vote somewhere else or find another candidate, you know, put up another candidate, work with others, because if it bothers you, it bothers others. So your candidate should be honest. I mean, there are plenty of things that I have people that I don't agree with in my constituency, but I'll be honest about, look, this is not my position. And if they want to run someone against me for it, that's up to them. It's a democracy. But I, but your your leadership, your representatives have a duty to you or should have a duty to you to be honest about where they stand. And sometimes I don't know where I stand on a particular issue. We deal with hundreds of bills every session. I cannot be a content, you know, a subject matter expert on everything. So I'm open to learning. And if you have a good persuasive argument, I might change my mind on an issue that, you know, that I'm not passionate about just because you can't be passionate about everything. So I'm open to listening and so should your representative, or at least if they have a fixed opinion, they should explain how they got there. Yeah. I really like that. It's, I think just saying that I don't know everything and that other people are actually able to talk and getting allies um, actually can really help and really educate because how can you expect everybody to know anything? There's been a big issue right now, um, particularly, I would say, in the left that we were talking about the other week, that there are the Jamal Bowmans, the AOCs, uh, the Rashida Talibs, all these people that don't represent, obviously, the majority of the Democrat Party. What is the Democrat Party doing to address this big problem that they have? 
I am so glad you asked that question because it's a fear among the Jewish community. It's a reasonable fear among the Jewish community to see what's happening on the far left. But there is reason to be optimistic. Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman both lost their primary elections. Jewish voters stepped up. Jewish donors stepped up. We made our voices heard and their constituents decided for whatever reasons that this these people did not represent their values. And so it's possible. So now the squad is down by two. AOC has now been trying to walk this line. She is now hated again by the far, you know, by the middle and by the far left. So, you know, I don't know how effective she'll be. Tlaib, I think, has isolated herself, especially without the help of Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman going into the next session. She has stood up. I mean, she couldn't say a nice word about killing Nasrallah. She is yet to say anything positive about the Jewish community or about the Israelis or the hostages who have suffered. Um, she's put no pressure. Not that she, I'm saying she has a direct line to Hamas, but she should be challenging the communities to challenge Hamas. Hamas is enabled because of these protests that they see on U.S. campuses by, by leaders like Rashida Tlaib who refuse to condemn them. And so... I'm glad that they are losing effectiveness. They are also a fringe member of the Democratic Party. Like Tom Massey is a fringe member of the Republican Party. These squad members are fringe on the Democratic Party. They're not even endorsing Kamala Harris. So, or at least Rashida Tlaib isn't. This uncommitted group, which Tlaib's sister, I think is one of the heads of, won't endorse any candidate, frankly. So. But Why I, I, would we I, consider them Democrats? Plus, plus, if I could just get this out, at the DNC, the uncommitted group, which was supported by Tlaib and Bush and the others, tried desperately, made quote unquote demands of the DNC to have a speaker put up on the night that Harris was to accept the nomination. And essentially the DNC gave him a middle finger and said, we don't care about you or we don't want you. You're not coming into our thing. You know, we don't trust you to stay on message. Uh, your history shows why we can't trust you to stay on message. And, you know, you, you disrupt our, our, our meetings and our conferences on our rallies. Why would we trust you? Why, we, you wouldn't put a Trumper up or never Trumper up at the RNC. They had no place at the DNC. So it was the DNC's reaction to the uncommitted that really gave me some solace knowing that the Democrats are going in the right direction on this. And I, then, I agree. I agree. I think, you know, the, I think the Democrats are uniting to realize this is not where we want to be and this does not help us. Uh, I do think that's the reason why still the majority of the Jewish population are actually voting for Democrats. Um, yes. Even though, even though, it, and, and I heard Trump's speech at the Israel American Council was he was saying, and, and they love taking things out of context on both sides, which I find ridiculous. But he was saying how he went from 20 percent of the Jewish vote to 28 percent by 2020, 2020. And then in 2024, he's talking, they're talking only in like 35 to 40 percent, which is like he's been killing himself for the Jewish vote. And he still can't get it because I think the Democrats are very smart that they've been positioning themselves to say these fringe people are not part of our party. What Correct. I don't understand, and I don't really like just for a matter of time, what I don't understand is the undecided vote. Like, OK, you're going to undecide. You're not going to vote. You, you were never going to vote for Trump, but you're not going to vote for Kamala Harris. If you don't vote for Kamala Harris, that gives Trump an edge because that could be a serious amount of, of votes in general. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense. Like, who would be better for you, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump? And I have a feeling... Honestly, I think Kamala Harris would be more sympathetic to their cause and allow for more conversation. Trump is, hell no, we don't talk, and I'm going to blow you up in 18 pieces. It's, it, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I mean, to me, it just is a question of power. This is how they are able to wield whatever power they think they have. When they first came out as the uncommitted, they, I, you know, it seemed to me like what, what I read is that Democratic Party went a little bit berserk because oh we're, we're losing these people we got to find them we got to go to them. they're giving power to the to these people and I think that's what it's really all about so now they just they're committed to the, they're committed to being uncommitted and they just have to stay on that train 
Yeah, well, I'm glad they're so bad at this because strategically they've made so many mistakes. I mean, you don't walk in, list your demands, and then when you don't get them, you're just like, okay, let's try something else. You know, they, they're, they're. I mean, you either, if you, I'm a lawyer, I don't make a, a promise that I can't keep. If I tell you I'm going to take you to trial or, you know, take some action if you don't do X, Y, or Z, I follow through because an empty threat Who's going to trust them next time to do? I mean, who cares what they have to say? They're not they're not going to abide by their own demands. So, you know, they've made themselves largely irrelevant. And look, if Trump wins, they are in a much worse place. 100 percent. They the Muslim bans coming back. And by the way, I was at the airport to fight against the Muslim ban. I was a lawyer at the airport. I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I went because I believe we were set. We said we need lawyers at the airport to try to talk to TSA and keep families together. And I went. I wouldn't be welcome there anymore as a Zionist. So they're now losing support that they would have had from community members. And <clears throat> Trump is going to see Gaza as beachfront property. He's going to build Gaza Lago there. And, you know, Trump, Trump, I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I don't understand how they don't believe Trump's going to be a million times worse for them. And they've likely lost empathy from a lot of people who would have empathized with them, but for this muck that they're creating and maybe giving us a Trump presidency. Yeah, I agree with you. So, so how so, do you see Harris? Like if Harris gets elected, what, how do you see that? Because a lot of people are nervous about that. Yeah. So the <clears throat> and the whole thing she's been talking about. So I... I'm not counting her husband, just like I wouldn't count Trump's daughter and son-in-law. Like to me, that doesn't mean anything. There are plenty of self-hating people or people who are terrible people who are related to Jews who still would, would do terrible things to Jews. So put that aside. That's not why I'm voting for her is because she has a Jewish husband. She has consistently been pro-Israel. She says she's not changing foreign policy. Biden has been pro-Israel. He may not be pro BB at times, but most Jews and Israelis are not pro BB. So he is consistently has called himself a Zionist. She has been to Israel. She has prosecuted hate crimes for people and while she was DA against um, people who harm Jews. She has a record. She is pro Jew and pro Israel. Trump claims to be pro-Israel, and I will grant him, he did good things. He did the Abraham Accords. He moved the embassy. I appreciate those things. But he's also dining with neo-Nazis. He refuses to, to condemn Tucker Carlson. J.D. Vance goes on Tucker Carlson. They want to isolate themselves from Ukraine. If you don't think Israel's next, if someone pisses Trump off, I mean, don't forget, Trump didn't talk to Bibi for years because Bibi had the gall to congratulate Biden on winning the election. So if you think that Trump is going to be loyal to Jews, think again. There is no reason to believe this. And by the way, uh, Nasrallah was killed days ago. Biden and Harris immediately came out with a statement thanking Israel for removing this, you know, cancer from the world. Trump hasn't said a word. He won't say whether he wants Ukraine to win. He's an isolationist. He's going to just, you know, it depends who sucks up to him best, who's going to get his favors. But if you piss him off, excuse my language, you're on the outs. And Jews cannot afford to be with somebody who is who lacks any type of moral character. But, but even Kamala if they've Harris occasionally done about, some things. She does Sorry, talk about a two state solution. And that's, I don't think that's workable. Well, I don't know that it's workable now. I think it's aspirational, but I don't think it's workable at this moment. I mean, I, I'm in favor of a two-state solution, but I can't imagine any scenario where it would exist in the near term, we given what Hamas did. As long as the security was guaranteed for Israel, but how can that Right. So that's why I think, I don't think anyone's saying on January 1st, we're going to recognize, you know, the state of Palestine and here are the borders. I don't think she's talking that. I think she's saying it's aspirational as well. That's the ultimate I don't think that goal. comes across. That doesn't come across to possibly me. possibly yeah, but I that's that. that's how I, i'm sorry I agree, I agree with that i i don't think she has that clear uh clear message 
Um, it's it's part of her, like how she expresses herself. She doesn't really speak very clearly. So a lot of people don't know her, her opinions and her policies. I think it's something that people, especially the Jewish community fear. And it hurts her. Yes. And I think she definitely has room to, to work on that. And I think yeah. if she said it was aspirational, a lot of people would agree with that. I do but... think that she will get better in time. She is clearly, she clearly knows how to get better. She is yes. significantly better than what she was in 2020. She's significantly better than she was in 2016. She's significantly better than pre being the VP, the president pick versus not like she is just like it's like night and day, like her debate against Pence compared to her debate against Trump. Like it was she was very impressive She as as a person. So I do I do believe in 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 growth and development. And I'm actually very happy that she was with Biden. I think she was she's a significantly better candidate right now than what she was four years ago. I think it was like. She kind of followed yes. him and, and did really well for him. I, I just sort of understand that she's between a rock and a hard place because she can't really say, okay, these are problems we have because she was part of developing that problem. So how is she going to say, okay, we're going to solve these part, you know, we're, we're going to solve the border problem now, you know, well, you created the border problem. Oh, you know, so she can't really come out and say it. Well, she said, I mean, she's pushed back on this border issue. There was a bill that Trump told the Republicans right. not that, to that's sign. That's very late in the, in the situation. It doesn't matter. It's it's there was a a possible solution that had been re, that had been agreed on by both leadership of both houses, and Trump was the one who stopped. Yeah. It. yeah so right. you can either try to solve the problem or leave the problem open. Leave you know leave things open so they become worse, and then you can just take. You know, you can call it a problem. I mean, I don't want a leader who just looks at it and thinks of a political response as opposed to a solution to a possible problem. Right. So so let me just ask you, this is an independent question. Sure. There's a, there's a big issue and there's a big talks right now and we hear it all the time is is money in politics. Yes. And and this the, the second side, the second part of the question is the insider trading in politics, which is something that could be true, could be not true. It's 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 more. um I would say it's more like show notes. It's more like headlines, but it's not actual reality. Can you just speak about money and politics and the whole concept of insider trading in the government? Sure. So insider trading, I'll speak first only because I know less about it. Um, I know we have to file very specific disclosures in Georgia when we uh, when we're elected. We have personal disclosure statements we have to file every year. I have to say where my money is, which I, I mean, I don't have to say which stock I'm invested in in a mutual fund, but I put them anyway because I, I'm as transparent as you can be. Um, I don't know that I get secret information that then I could act on. I'm not in, an, you know, we don't have like secret intelligence committees like the federal Congress does that they might learn Maybe information. Maybe you wouldn't tell us if you did, though wouldn't be for this podcast. Well, you know, right, right. No, I wouldn't tell you. I could I could tell you I'm on a committee that I can't talk about, okay. but but I'm not on any, any of those. So maybe they exist. I'm unaware of them, at least in Georgia. So um, we also have very strong sunshine laws in Georgia, open records acts, things like that. So although they don't always apply to the legislature, but uh, the disclosure forms. And if you violate, if you misfile your disclosure form, you're subject to sanctions, whether that's a fine or whether that's prosecution. So there are, you know, I, I can't really speak to the federal government, but insider trading, insider trading is illegal. Acting on insider tips from in Congress should be illegal if it's already, if it's not already. So or enforced if it's already illegal, which I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. So you know, the fear that um, people have on that is that these politicians are making $170,000 a year and they're living in $10 million homes. Yeah, it's a little strange. It, uh, and it, I think the disclosures, our disclosures would show that I have to put where I live. I have to put I mean, I, I have to and I'm a lawyer, so I put more stuff than I'm required to just because I don't ever want to be questioned on anything like that. So I'm happy to put it out. I'm an open book in terms of politics and money. Yes. I mean, I've had to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars for my initial race um, to to win. And then there are races now, state house races that are costing half a million dollars each candidate. So there are flippable districts. Um, my opponent, fortunately, is not very aggressive, but, you know, it doesn't mean I, I'm not I, I can't work. I, I don't have to try or work hard or 
listen to my constituents and talk to them and get feedback and understand what they want. Of course I do, that's the job, but it is a ridiculous amount of money in some districts in order to Yeah, it's really serious. It can be serious money. And and it does definitely influence the way that people that the way that people will vote and the way that your representative, like for example, the lobbyists of pharmaceutical companies, all of a sudden pharmaceutical companies give certain certain congressmen, senators, representatives. Well, we have the whole problem right now with the mayor of New York City. I mean, yes. he's under indictment, and you know, he took some trips to Turkey, and he's saying that right, oh, which is even more not dangerous because it's foreign influence, you know, right. by now by somebody who's not, not an ally. It's that it's, not, I it's, just it's, assumed that he would have a full head of hair if he came back from Turkey. Like that would be that would really give it away because he would have the hair plant and like transplants. Uh, and all the hair. Like that would okay. really be <laughs> that, that would really Turkey. be like a he real went to Turkey. It looks amazing. Uh, he does look really good. <laughs> So, I mean, it does influence and I, I do feel like there should be um, less money in politics or something very specific. Like there has to be some control of it. It can't just be that somebody just writes a check for $50 million and that person all of a sudden is just elected. And that's the end of it. Like that's the end of it because they're able to do these targeting pam- campaigns. And I really think that there should be something going on in that. You've had this amazing career um, that you've been such a fighter. I mean, you've been a fighter for family law. You've been fighter for in, in, on the criminal side too. And now you're actually fighting for the representation of the people in Georgia. Why, where did that moment, there was a moment in your life that allowed you to be so resilient and tough. What was that moment in your life that, uh, like your defining moment that allowed you to be that? That's a really interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I know, I think yeah. about it. So I, I don't know that it's one moment. I think it's lots of moments. Um, um, you know, I ran for office because the representative before me, not my representative, but uh, in a neighboring county was the only Jewish representative. And then I was called by two members of the legislature who were not Jewish and said, did you know there will be no Jews once Mike retires or stops, you know, doesn't run again. And I said, that can't be true. I cannot believe that that's true. And because there are 236 members of the Georgia legislature and not to have any, I, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. So I checked with people and I said, I, I got to check to see if that's true. But, and then I turned to my husband, I said, if, if it's true, then I, I'm going to run unless you, Why do you think that reason. is, why do you think there are no other Jews in there? I think, well, first, I didn't know this because I wasn't in politics, but it's also true in Alabama and South Carolina and Kansas that there are only one, besides Georgia, only one Jewish representative in each of those states. What was her name? The, your friend? Beth South Bernstein. Carolina? Yeah, she's very sweet. Yes. She's, she's also South state Carolina. representative, not a congresswoman. I think everyone's Congress people. That's okay. We, I, I don't know if it's a promotion or not, but I appreciate it. Uh, and I know where it's coming from. So, and I think it's technically true. It's just, you know, that's not but, what we all call right, ourselves. So I didn't, I didn't, there was no false. I, I, yeah. I mean, it's the Georgia it's Congress. Grand, so I guess that would be the technical yeah, the excuse, but yes. Um, so, you know, I was in debate in high school. I learned the skills of how to speak. I went to law school. I was a public defender. I've always tried to speak for people who have no voice. And, you know, I, I've been involved in nationally covered trials uh, as a lawyer, and and I've always had to fight for my clients. So I've always had this passion and it just was redirected towards politics when there was a need. I'm not I wasn't looking to run for office. I, after Trump won, I considered doing it because I was so put off by him that I thought, well, yelling at the TV is not getting me anywhere. Maybe I can do something. And I had advocated on behalf of child sexual assault victims in the Georgia legislature before I ran. So I could see how the sausage was made and and I knew that I could do as good a job as many of those people, if not better. So. I figured I had the skills to do it. Uh, I had the training to do it. And it was just a desire. As a whole does not feel like that, like you do. Like your sounds like you're pretty exceptional. Well, that's very kind. There are a lot of people who have 
very a nice guy. Leave me you alone. know, there are a lot of people with talents that I don't have that do that contribute in other ways. So, you know, I needed I needed the Jewish community to come and show up for HB 30. And they did. Not everybody could do that. But, you know, we had enough people who could. So people are trying to step up in the ways that they are talented in. But mine just happens to be that I'm loud and I'm not afraid. So those are good skills to have if you're a politician. But what, what, where did that come from? I grew up in Miami, maybe. <laughs> it's just yeah. kind of who we are. But well, <laughs> yeah, but I also grew up in a Jewish community. I grew up with Jewish values. My mother and my parents are Zionists. Or my father was before his passing. And my mother was in Israel during the Six Day War studying at Hebrew University. And she hitchhiked to the old city and was probably one of the first civilians to get it. So I, my mother would be, and my grandmother, uh, also active in Hadassah their entire lives, my entire life. So I've always been around people who advocated for the Jewish community. And so this is just a natural extension of that. Are your next thoughts perhaps to go to Washington? Is that like, is that the, the career path or how does, is that something you're thinking about or that's off the table, forget about it? Nothing's off the table, but it's also not in my plans. I don't really have, you know, I'm not one who plans five years out. I kind of just go with the flow and see if there's an opportunity that interests me, then I'll go for it. It's kind of how I run my practice. It's kind of, you know, I'll take cases that aren't necessarily in my wheelhouse if I can get somebody who is expert at it to assist me. So, because I don't want to compromise my client, but we were the first people in Georgia to see the Boy Scouts for sexual assault of clients when they were children. So I, I helped put them in bankruptcy and I'm proud of that. So, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't afraid. admit what they did. And so, and they wouldn't compensate our clients. So we kept going, we just kept pushing. So um, it's just, that's my superpower, I guess. I don't, I'm not afraid of people like, I think I'm supposed to be afraid of, but um, you don't have to be afraid of anybody. And I love right. that you have a Wonder Woman in your background. Uh, yes. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if it's your room or your child's room, but it's. Nope, this is my office. And I also have the Good Witch and the Bad Witch because you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> and a friend of mine wrote a book. Uh, I am Wonder Woman. He's a high school friend, Brad Meltzer. So I have his books and and I like the color in the room. So yeah, it looks good. Meltzer, it looks isn't great. that a famous author, Brad Meltzer? Yeah. Cool. Yes, he is. That's your he friend. Is. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I read all those yeah, books. Yeah, we were in all high school debates together. And I, I've read all those books. Oh, he's fabulous. I have bought all his books to support him. I haven't, I'm not much of a uh, reader these good. days, except for all the things I have to read. And that takes up most of my time. But yeah, it's brutal. Um, Esther, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Uh, thanks for being an amazing representative. And it's not just what you're doing. What I love about these state representatives and, 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 lo and more state departments is you're able to make a larger impact and then other, con other states are able to mirror what you've already done. So you've really led the way, uh, across the country on these bills. And it's, I know it's being passed in other states as well. I know, uh, our friend is in Nevada trying to protect the, the yep. Jewish students. And now because of what the success he's gotten, that's also going to other states. Uh, and Brian's coming on in the next few days. So it's okay. really been amazing to see what people, when you do stand up, that we're not, the Jewish people are, are united. We're not alone and that they're actual people who will do the work that needs to get done. So we commend you. Uh, we hope you stay in office and have a terrible law career for the rest of your career. <laughs> Oh, don't say that <laughs> you can just continue can to represent us both. it's hard to do both. i am doing both i am it's, doing both it's a lot of reading. thank god for my law partner who thank takes god most of the burden. Partner, thank but, god but this yes is, this is really what what um it's really amazing what you're doing so we really appreciate you coming on really appreciate you telling your story and being so open with us and and giving our listeners a, a different perspective than than normally they would yeah. get i'm sure my dad got a different perspective than his normal get and i could feel him holding on and wanting to ask more questions so it's very interesting and uh, we really appreciate you how can people find you how can people get connected to you so my campaign website is estherforgeorgia.com e-s-t-h-e-r-f-o-r-g-e-o-r-g-i-a.com i'm on twitter at e panich and um i think you're on instagram too i am on instagram yes your Somebody popcorn. helps me with that. So I don't even know my handle, but yes, I'm the only <laughs> Esther Panich out there. So, and I'm the only Esther in state government in Georgia. So great. it's easy to find. Uh, yeah. Me. One Jew, one Jew in a sea of, of sea of non-Jews. Correct. You're doing great. Correct. It's Esther. And, and, and it's, it's Esther. an Esther. 
Thank, right. thank you, Esther, for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.